With vasculitis, you have inflammation of the blood vessels. And even though this can happen in arteries or veins, we're going to focus on vasculitis in the arteries because it's way more common. Vasculitides, plural for vasculitis, are characterized by the size of the blood vessels they affect. So we have small vessel, medium vessel, and large vessel vasculitis. Typically, vasculitis is due to an autoimmune disease, where the immune system confuses a part of the normal body as a foreign invader. And there are a couple ways this might happen. Sometimes the body confuses the innermost layer of the blood vessel, which is the endothelial layer, with a foreign pathogen and directly attacks it. To be a little bit more specific, the white blood cells of the immune system mix up the normal antigens on the endothelial cells with the antigens of foreign invaders, like bacteria, simply because they look similar, and this is called molecular mimicry. This autoimmune confusion is thought to be the cause of several types of medium vessel and large vessel vasculitides. Other times the immune system attacks healthy cells that are near the vascular endothelium, and the endothelial cells are only indirectly damaged. This is the situation in many small vessel vasculitides, where the immune system attacks white blood cell enzymes or other non-endothelial cell targets. Once the endothelium is damaged, either directly or indirectly, almost all vasculitis diseases progress in a similar way. The damaged endothelium exposes the underlying collagen and tissue factor, and these exposed materials increase the chance of blood coagulation. The blood vessel walls themselves get weaker as they're more damaged making aneurysms more likely. And as the vessel wall heals, it becomes harder and stiffer because fibrin is deposited into the vessel walls as part of the healing process. And actually, that's vasculitis in a nutshell. The different types of vasculitis, for the most part, only vary depending on how they're triggered and where in the body they cause problems. People with vasculitis have generalized symptoms caused by the inflammatory response of the immune system. Symptoms like fever, weight loss, fatigue, and so on. More specific symptoms occur usually based off where in the body the vasculitis is occurring, and which organ is supplied by that blood vessel. When vasculitis happens in those blood vessels, you get reduced blood flow to those organs, called organ ischemia, which can happen in two ways. First, blood cells clump onto the exposed tissue factor and collagen on the inside of the blood vessels, forming blood clots that can restrict blood flow. The second way is caused by the healing process of the blood vessel, as fibrin is deposited in the vessel wall, the walls become thicker and bulge into the vessel, reducing the diameter of the vessel lumen, and restricting blood flow. Alright, now that we have the general idea of vasculitis covered, let's take a look at some of the more specific conditions, starting with large vessel vasculitides. Giant cell arteritis is a vasculitis that affects branches of the corroded arteries. Vasculitis in the temporal branch of the corroded artery is the most common location and causes headaches. Vasculitis in the ophthalmic artery can cause visual disturbances, and vasculitis in any of the arteries that supply the jaw muscles can cause pain when someone chews food, called claudication. Giant cell arteritis affects older individuals, typically more than 50 years old, and women more than men, so a grandmother would be a high-risk group. Classically, this type of vasculitis causes lots of inflammation and it results in a really high erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR for short, sometimes over 100. In giant cell arteritis, a biopsy of the affected artery will show giant cells embedded in the internal elastic lamina, which is a thin layer of elastic tissue that separates the tunica intima and tunica media. To be clear, these giant cells are actually not individual cells at all, but rather they're granulomas, a group of monocytes that are packed tightly together and look like one giant cell. Now, giant cell arteritis is segmental, meaning that if you look at the entirety of an affected artery, you'll see only sections of the artery that are actually affected. This means that when biopsies are done, you have to take a long section of the artery and examine it under a microscope. It also means that if you don't see any affected tissue, you can't for sure rule out the disease because it's possible you took an unaffected section of the blood vessel. You can treat people with giant cell arteritis by giving them corticosteroids, which weakens the immune response. People whose ophthalmic artery is affected and don't receive treatment are at a high risk of blindness, again because poor blood flow to the eyes causes ischemia and irreversible blindness. Alright, so another type of large cell vasculitis is called Takayasu arteritis, and is very similar to giant cell arteritis except for two key differences. One is that it usually affects Asian women that are under 40 years old, where giant cell arteritis usually affects people over the age of 50. 
and two, it affects the arteries that branch off from the aortic arch, particularly around the branch points. If the inflammation happens around the aortic branches that serve the upper extremities, it can cause weak or non-existent pulse. If the inflammation happens around the aortic branch that serves the head, then it can cause visual and neurological symptoms. Histopathologically, it's pretty similar to giant cell arteritis because in Takayasu arteritis, you still see giant cells and granulomatous inflammation in the internal elastic lamina of the blood vessel. In addition, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate will be elevated, and Takayasu arteritis is treated with corticosteroids. Alright, so now let's move on to the medium-sized vasculitis diseases. These vasculitis diseases typically affect a wide range of muscular arteries that supply organs, which gives the conditions a wide range of possible symptoms. The most common type of all vasculitides is Kawasaki disease, and we've got a separate video on Kawasaki disease, but for now it's important to note that it affects the coronary arteries, the muscular arteries serving the heart. Next there's polyarteritis nodosa, which is thought to occur when the immune cells directly attack the endothelium, confusing it with hepatitis B virus. Now polyarteritis nodosa causes transmural inflammation, which means the entire wall the tunica intima, the media, and the adventitia are all affected. The inflammation causes the vascular wall to die through all three layers of the artery and fibrosis occurs as the vascular wall heals. And this process is called fibrinoid necrosis. The fibrosed vessel wall is left weak and prone to aneurysms, so some areas start to bulge out through the weakened walls. So if you take a step back and look at the artery, you see these fibrotic aneurysms, which are hard bulges down the length of the artery and they look like a string of beads on angiogram. This pattern is pretty unique among the various vasculitides. Organ ischemia and the distribution of affected arteries is the main complication. If the renal arteries are affected, then a person will have hypertension, because remember that the kidneys regulate blood volume. If the mesenteric artery is affected, a person can have mesenteric ischemia and severe abdominal pain and gastrointestinal bleeding. If the arteries supplying the brain are affected, it can cause neurological symptoms. And if arteries supplying the skin are affected, then it can lead to skin lesions. Treatment is aimed at reducing the vessel inflammation and generally includes corticosteroids as well. Another medium vessel vasculitis is Berger's disease, named for a New York City pathologist, not a fancy hamburger. Its other name is thromboangiitis obliterans, which literally translate to clot vessel inflammation blockage. And as the name suggests, this vasculitis is notorious for causing blood clots in tiny arteries in the fingers and toes, which leads to ulcers and eventually dead tissue in these digits and eventually auto-amputation. Not fun. Berger's disease typically affects men between the ages of 20 and 40 years old, and the biggest risk factor for vasculitis is the use of tobacco products. In fact, it's thought that tobacco might be the trigger for the autoimmune response against the blood vessels. Stopping the use of tobacco actually slows down, but doesn't necessarily stop, the disease and need for amputations in most patients. Okay, on to small vessel vasculitis. Small vessel vasculitis affects small vessels like arterioles, capillaries, and venules. In the diseases, B cells mistakenly target their antibodies to granules made by the person's own neutrophils. In a sense, one immune cell attacking the other. The antibodies are called anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies, or ANCAs for short, and they're mainly of the IgG type. The disease granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or GPA, which used to be called Wegener's granulomatosis, is one of these small vessel vasculitides. The B cells release an autoantibody called cytoplasmic anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody, or c -anca. Yes, the name is hilariously redundant with cytoplasmic included twice to drive home the point. C. ANCAs target and bind to a specific neutrophil granule called proteinase 3, which is embedded in the membrane of some neutrophils. Once C. ANCA binds to the neutrophil, it causes the neutrophil to release oxygen-free radicals, which can then indirectly damage the nearby endothelial cells, causing vasculitis. On a biopsy, you can see evidence of inflammation in granulomas in the blood vessel wall. GPA affects the nasopharynx, lungs, and kidneys, and usually occurs in middle-aged males. People with the disease can have chronic pain caused by sinusitis or bloody mucus from ulcers within the nose. Over time, the nose itself might even cave in or curl, a condition called a saddle nose deformity. Blood vessel inflammation in the lungs and air passages can also make breathing more difficult, 
causing air passages to constrict, and ulcers can form, causing bloody coughing. In the kidneys, the inflammation restricts blood flow to the glomeruli, causing them to die and leading to decreased urine production and an increase in blood pressure, since the kidneys are no longer as efficient at regulating blood volume. GPA is typically treated with corticosteroids and cyclophosphamide, but relapses in the disease are common, and that makes sense. The presence of C. anca is the main cause of the disease, and if it keeps attacking the granules from within neutrophils, then there's a good chance the disease will come back. Another small vessel vasculitis that's very similar to granulomatosis with polyangiitis is microscopic polyangiitis. It's so similar, in fact, that you need to rely on some clues to help you distinguish them. Microscopic polyangiitis doesn't affect the blood vessels of the nose and sinuses, only the kidneys and the lungs. You also won't see the granulomas in the blood vessel walls like you would in granulomatosis with polyangiitis. The third difference is that you won't find C. ancas. Instead, you'll find P. ancas. The P stands for perinuclear, which is just a different type of anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody reacting with the neutrophil granule myeloperoxidase instead of proteinase 3. You treat microscopic polyangiitis the same way you treat granulomatosis with polyangiitis, corticosteroids and cyclophosphamide, and it's also common for it to relapse. churg strauss syndrome is very similar to both granulomatosis with polyangiitis and microscopic polyangiitis. It's also caused by P. anca antibodies, and it causes similar symptoms like sinusitis, lung damage, and kidney damage. But it also causes gastrointestinal, skin, nerve, and heart damage, like some medium vessel vasculitis diseases. A lot of the time, churg strauss syndrome is mistaken as allergies and asthma, because they all have similar symptoms. That, and like allergies and asthma, churg strauss causes a lot of eosinophils to float around in the blood. Actually, people who have asthma and peripheral eosinophilia are more likely to develop churg strauss syndrome because they both have elevated eosinophils. Also, just like granulomatosis with polyangiitis, granulomas can form. Next up is henox schonlein purpura. Now, unlike other small vessel vasculitis diseases we've talked about, henox schonlein purpura, shortened to HSP, doesn't involve ANCAs. Instead, we find elevated levels of the IgA antibodies floating around in the blood. Now, IgA is an awesome antibody that's found in our mucosal cells, which are the cells that are in some way exposed to the outside world. For example, the cells in our lungs or our gastrointestinal tract. In HSP, the person starts making IgA that directly targets their own endothelial cells, likely because of molecular mimicry. And this goes against the general trend of small vessel vasculitides being the result of indirect damage. Symptoms are going to depend on where the IgA decided to attack the small blood vessels. One more common place is the skin blood vessels around the buttocks and legs, which leads to a significant skin discoloration that looks like blood is pooling under the skin surface, called papura. One indication that the disease is HSP is that the skin discoloration is palpable, as in you can feel it raised above the normal skin. Remember, the fibrosis of the blood vessel walls hardens and makes it palpable. So just like in polyarteritis nodosa, if the IgA attacks the blood vessels in the gastrointestinal tract, it can cause abdominal pain, and if it attacks the blood vessels in the kidneys, it can lead to hematuria, blood in the urine, and eventually affect the kidney's function, which is called IgA nephropathy. Just like the other small vessel vasculitis diseases, HSP resolves on its own, but it can reoccur. Generally, it's only treated with steroids if the symptoms are severe. All right, as a quick recap. Vasculitis means inflammation of the blood vessels, typically caused by immune-mediated damage to the endothelial cells. Based on the size of blood vessels they affect, there are small vessel, medium vessel, and large vessel types of vasculitis. Symptoms vary based on the organ supplied by the affected blood vessel, but more general symptoms include fever, weight loss, and fatigue. And treatment for vasculitis includes corticosteroids, Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, take a look at osmosis.org where we have flashcards, questions, and other awesome tools to help you learn medicine. Otherwise, you can always support us by donating on Patreon, subscribing to our channel, or following us on social media.